Hare Krishna Pat Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Mansi Ganga Mataji. Thank you Hare very Krishna. much. Hare Krishna, everyone. Pranam to both of you. Okay, thank you very much, Mataji. Hare Krishna Mataji, Mansi Ganga Mataji, Hare Krishna to you. There is a silence, so we are taking this opportunity to get a response to you. Hey, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna to our friends from all over the world here. Trying to open my reference. Thank you, all the devotees, for joining uh, us today from all over the world. We really appreciate and please. If you uh, so desire, we are uh, we have this class every day from eight to nine, uh, but with different speakers. So you are very welcome. Thank you Hare for joining. Today. Hare Krishna, Hari Bob. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we'll get started. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we were on Nectar of Instruction. We finished the first four verses. I'm just going to start the slideshow over here and share my screen. <coughs> So just to quickly recap, the first verse was about the qualities of a guru. The second verse was about six things that are detrimental to our devotional service. The third thing, third verse was the six items that are favorable to our devotional service. And uh, the fourth verse was the six kind of loving exchanges between devotees. Now the question may ask, when you say devotee, what exactly do you mean by devotee? You know, the six exchanges. <clears throat> Are there different types of devotees? Are there different levels? Are there different grades of devotee? Are all devotees just devotees? And we treat all devotees exactly the same way? The answer is no. And that we learn in text number five, different kinds of Vaishnavas. Krishna tiyasya giritam manasadriyeta diksha sichet pranati bhischa bhajantam isham shushru shaya bhajana vigya mananya manya ninda dishonya mrida ipsita sangalabhya. That's the fifth verse, which means one should mentally honor the devotee who chants the holy name of Lord Krishna. One should offer humble obeisances to the devotee who has undergone spiritual initiation, diksha, and is engaged in worshipping the deity. And one should associate with and faithfully serve that pure devotee who is advanced in undeviated devotional service and whose heart is completely devoid of the propensity to criticize others. So here, Rupa Goswami is describing a number of different kinds of Vaishnavas. How many kinds is he describing? Three. Three kinds. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada explains what those three kinds are. So the beginner devotee who has just undergone initiation and is worshipping the deity, but that person is not mature enough to know how to deal with other devotees properly, nicely with proper etiquette. They may be offensive. They may not be knowing what to do, what not to do, but they're starting out. That person is known as Kanishta Adhikari. The first uh, initial beginner stage of devotee, beginner category, you can say, neophyte. Then the second one is called Madhyama Adhikari. So Madhyama Adhikari. So Kanishta has received Harinam initiation. The Madhyam Adhikari has also received initiation 
and is fully engaged in the loving service of the Lord. Now, why is the Madhyama considered higher? Because the Madhyama, Adhikari, will know how to deal with other people. The Madhyama Adhikari shows compassion to the innocent, develops deep and loving friendship with other devotees, and avoids those who are very inimical, envious, or poison, toxic. <laughs> so that is the definition of the difference between Kanishta and Madhyama is Kanishta, the faith is weak, they know that the Lord is in the temple <clears throat> and they worship the deity. But they may not understand that the Lord is also in other people's hearts, in everyone's heart. So they may not know how to respect properly, talk with other people. They don't know how, how to have proper etiquette and so on. And so that is the difference between those two. And then the highest is called Uttama Adhikari. Uttama Adhikari is the one that is described over here also is a pure devotee who is very advanced in undeviated devotional service and they don't do anything other than serving the lord that's all they do and the key thing over here is they are completely devoid of the propensity to criticize others they will never criticize anybody so if we find even a little bit of propensity to criticize somebody then we know we are not at Uttam level. It's actually very rare to be at that level. But we have to work toward it. So Srila Prabhupada, he says that, uh, he explains in the purport that Uttama Dikari is basically someone who is very transcendental, who worships Krishna with offenses, does not make offenses to other devotees, and is always meditating on serving and spreading the Krishna conscious movement and serving the Lord in this way. So, in the Chaitanya Chaitanya, Prabhupada quotes this verse in the purport. He says, Shraddha Shabde, Vishwasha Kohe, Shud Krida Nishchoy, Krishna Bhakti Kaile, Sarva Karma Krita Hoy. <laughs> that by rendering transcendental service to Krishna, one automatically performs all subsidiary activities. Sarva karma krita hoy. Everything else gets taken care of. You don't have to worry about other things. This confident and firm faith favorable to discharge of devotional service is called Shraddha. So now, the depth and strength of Shraddha determines whether a person is in Kanishta, Madhyama or Uttama stage. If one Shraddha is shakeable, is weak. They have some faith, but it's very weak. Someone else can easily convince them that, you know, this is not the best. You should give it up. They can, they will give it up sometimes. That is called Kanishta. Madhyama, they'll be strong enough to resist anybody else telling them to give it up. Oh, there's no way. Madhyama will never give up Krishna consciousness. They may not have the full strength to present solid arguments to defeat the other person, but they themselves will never give up Krishna consciousness. So their faith is much stronger. And Uttama Dekari is one whose faith is so strong and so influential that even if somebody comes in front of them, that person will get strongly influenced by the depth and strength of the Uttama Dekari's faith. So much so that they will also want to take up Krishna consciousness very seriously. So that is another angle on how we can identify Uttama. So Uttama Dekari is the best kind of spiritual master. So if we want a spiritual master, we want to make sure that spiritual master is fully engaged in Krishna consciousness. They have no other business but to spread Krishna consciousness. Their faith is very, very strong and they have strong love for Krishna. That Uttam Adhikari should be served, should be um, studied from, and we should learn a lot from them as much as possible. So that is the Uttam Adhikari. Okay? So those are three levels explained in text five. Prabhuji, now, can I ask a question? Yes, sure, please. Uh, Prabhuji, so we are not initiated, so we are not even neophytes. Who are we? Yeah, initiation is required to even be considered Kanishta Dikari. Yes, so we are not even neophytes. We, we can be considered uh, aspiring devotees. Aspiring. That's why we say we're aspiring, aspiring devotees. Uh, we, when, when we say we're aspiring to get initiation, we're aspiring to 
So initiation is a requirement if you study Chaitanya Charitamrit. Initiation is not optional. It is said without initiation, one cannot uh, make the full progress of Krishna consciousness. So that is required. But also at the same time, we should be careful to only accept a pure uh, devotee, Uttama Dekari, for spiritual master, for initiation. But yes, we can consider ourselves that we are uh, aspiring and we want to accept initiation. Guruji, another question. For the Uttama Dekari, you said that they don't offend anybody and they, I, I misunderstood. Did you say they don't offend the uh, Krishna and the, uh, everybody else? Correct, correct. Uttama Dekari are uh, free from offenses. They do not offend others. They are not envious of others, therefore they do not offend others. They are not inimical or malicious to others. They are full of compassion. For the fallen souls and so someone who is full of compassion uh, will not offend for sure that is that is one of the features of uttam adhikari all right thank you so we can continue text number six so okay we talked about uttam adhikari pure devotee so how should we judge a devotee or how should we also not judge? there's certain things we should not be judgmental about so that is what we learn in text number six, a pure devotee. Drishtai sabhava janitai rvapushascha doshai na prakritatta me habakta janasya pashe ganga basam na kalubud buddha pena pankair brahma dravatama pagachati nira dharmai. So I would strongly encourage if you could memorize some of these verses then when you're reading them, it comes much smoother. You know, If you have memorized verses, when you read them, they come much smoother. If you make some attempt at memorizing, it'll help you a lot. It also sounds nice when you're reading a verse that moves smoothly. So text number six, translation by Srila Prabhupada. Being situated in his original Krishna conscious position, a pure devotee does not identify with the body. That we understand. Such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view. Indeed, one should overlook a devotee's having a body born in a low family, a body with a bad complexion, a deformed body or a diseased or infirm body. According to ordinary vision, such imperfections may seem prominent in the body of a pure devotee. But despite such seeming defects, the body of a pure devotee cannot be polluted. It is exactly like the waters of the Ganges, which sometimes during the rainy season are full of bubbles, foam, and mud. The Ganges water do not become polluted. Those who advance in spiritual understanding will bathe in the Ganges without considering the condition of the water. So that is a very important aspect of seeing correctly someone who has dedicated his life to Krishna consciousness. See, we are used to being judgmental. We are used to categorizing people. And in one sense, it is very natural to categorize people. Because when we know how to categorize people correctly, we know how to deal with them correctly. So categorization is not wrong. In fact, the previous verse before this is basically categorizing devotees at three levels, it's the categories. So we need to categorize. We need to have a sense of what is called discrimination, how to differentiate, but not discrimination based on bodily features. So this is a warning. Yes, we are discriminating who is Uttama, who is Madhyama, who is Kanishta, and how to deal with them. With Kanishta, we give respect from a distance. With Madhyama, we make friendship. And with Uttama, we serve them. So it's important to categorize. But we should not use superficial things for our categorization purposes. Oh, you know, if he's born in a nice Brahman family, then he's Uttama. If he's born in a Shudra family or Chandal family, or if he's born in this kind of family or his skin is this color or is deformed like this, he has a bad complexion, or oh, this kind of superficial things. If we categorize based on them, that is called false discrimination. 
it is so offensive. I mean, it's even considered illegal. Long time ago, it was considered legal. And people realize what a ghastly thing it is to be discriminating based on race, based on language, based on color, based on so many things, on gender. You can't discriminate based on that. Until recently, even women were not allowed to vote. Until as recently as like 60 years ago or something like that in America. Or, you know, like 100 years ago, they weren't allowed to vote. Oh, is there a question? Uh, let me see. Sorry, I just want to make sure. Okay. So my point is discrimination is important, but it should not be based on bodily designations. Okay. So same kind of thing. We cannot make a judgment on a pure devotee based on superficial things. And if there are such defects or such differences that we are not used to, we should overlook them. It says that, right? We should overlook them. We should recognize the insignificant. Okay. So that's the message of text number six. Move on to text number seven. Sya Krishna Nama Charitabi Sitapya Vidya Pitto Patapta Rasanasya Narochi Kanu Kintva Daradanu Dinam Kalusai Vajushta Swadvi Kramad Bhavati Tagga the Mula Hantri. So now this text is entitled The Power of the Holy Names. How powerful they are. So the holy name, character, pastimes, and activities of Krishna are all transcendentally sweet, like sugar candy. Although the tongue of one afflicted by the jaundice of avidya, ignorance, cannot taste anything sweet, it is wonderful that simply by carefully chanting these sweet names every day, a natural relish awakens within his tongue and his disease is gradually destroyed at the root. So what is this disease? Jaundice. The jaundice is a disease of the liver. It's a kind of uh, hepatitis. And I remember I was very young, maybe I was like seven years old or something like that, seven or eight in Nairobi. And I also had the jaundice. And my eyes had turned yellow and I was having some lot of like feeling very sick and weak and everything I looked was yellow. Anything I ate tasted really bad, bitter. Now I had tasted long before that some sugarcane juice. It's my favorite thing to drink, sugarcane juice. So tasty. They used to get it from this um, freshly made. There was one shop uh, near, uh, anyway, I think it was in Nagara area, somewhere there. It was a really nice shop. Um, where they used to make this fresh sugar cane juice and they used to sell them in bottles like this. And so every now and then they used to buy us to drink it. This time they bought for me six bottles, just for me. And they said, this is your favorite juice. I said, I was so happy to drink it. And, the, and then first drink, first sip I had, I thought something is wrong. I said, looks like you guys got cheated because they've given you something wrong in, in the name of sugar cane juice, so bitter and so nasty. They said, no, no, this is sugar cane juice. It tastes nasty to you because you have this jaundice. Uh, but you, this is a medicine for you. So now something that is inherently sweet by itself, it's not the fault of the juice. The fault is in my tongue. It's covered with this disease. So I just drank it and it was hard for me to drink. But after about three bottles and about a few days of, uh, you know, recovery and drinking this, it actually helped me recover faster. And the rest of the three bottles I enjoyed like anything. Uh, then they said, no, now you're feeling okay. You don't need to drink it. I said, no, no, let me, you got it for me. Let me drink it. It was so tasty. The point is that Krishna's holy names are inherently sweet. If we actually taste the effect of it after recovering from this avidya, this jaundice of avidya, pitta upatapta, pitta upatapta, upatapta is this burning disease. Pitta, pitta means bile coming out from the liver. Pitta upatapta rasanasya narochika anu. This is the medicine for that uh, jaundice. We cannot taste the sweetness now because we are in avidya. And what is avidya? Avidya means to think I am this body. Of course, we know avidya means ignorance or no knowledge. But what level of ignorance? 
basic avidya is this one problem we have is to think i am this body the moment we recognize and start acting on the understanding i'm not this body and the eternal servant of the lord i have a deep and sweet relationship with lord krishna and you start acting on it then gradually we recover from the jaundice and then the name of the lord which is inherently sweet will actually become tasty for us it's not the name has changed it's our disease has been recovered we have we have kind of removed that in uh, uh, a bitterness uh, from our mouths bitterness of avidya the disease of avidya pitta 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 and how does it happen swadvi kramad the word swad means taste or sweetness in fact the english word sweet comes from the Sans sanskrit word swad well the same same word swadvi kramad kramad means gradually krama so gradually what happens we have to keep drinking this holy name the nectar whether we like it or not whether we have developed taste or not but we should aim at removing this jaundice by drinking the holy name and gradually what happens the root the root of avidya to think on this body gets destroyed swadvi kramad bhavati tad gada mula hantri mula means root so it gets uprooted this is the medicine and the enjoyable drink both at the same time is bitter in the beginning sweet at the end actually it's sweet in the beginning also but our problem is we have the disease okay is the power of the holy name we continue our rupa goswami's message now this one number 8 is called the essence of all advice iti upadesha saram saram means the the essence or the um, the cream or the conclusive uh, message that we are supposed to take from this book therefore text number 8 is the advice we are supposed to apply in our life so what is the advice actually let me read the sanskrit then read the sanskrit here tannam roopa charita di sukirtananu smrityo kramena rasana manasi niyojya tishthan vrajeta danuragi jananu gami kalam nayedakhilam ityu padesha saram essence of all advice is that one should utilize one's full time 24 hours a day in doing what in nicely chanting and remembering the lord's divine name transcendental form qualities and eternal pastimes thereby gradually engaging one's tongue and mind in this way one should reside in braja goloka vrindavan dham and serve krishna under the guidance of devotees one should follow in the footsteps of the lord's beloved devotees who are deeply attached to his devotional service so what is the summary of this message that we should not waste any time we should use all our time in chanting and remembering chanting and remembering so even when we are working we should always keep that background of remembrance of krishna my lord i am working for you and then we do very first class quality work for the lord when we are interacting with our family members expressing loving exchanges you know saying some nice words to each other encouraging each other giving each other support and strength we should keep in mind my lord thank you for this nice family that you have given me and then my dear family let us all worship the lord together let us find ways to strengthen our spiritual life mm -hmm. so we we express our gratitude to the lord and we express our gratitude to the family also for what they are contributing in our spiritual life this way we are basically chanting and remembering the lord mm -hmm. the lord's divine name form qualities how because the only way to do it 24 hours is to recognize the lord's hand in everything in our life otherwise it will only be maybe half an hour or one hour or two hours and then what about the other 22 hours 
you see so we cannot make it unless we see the lord's hand in everything this is the essence of all advice essence is iti upadesha saram yeah and what does that end up doing basically if you are chanting remembering the lord's uh, qualities and names etc all the time what ends up happening is we end up residing tishtan vrajet vraja vraja is a spiritual world we reside in the spiritual world without having to leave our bodies and how we do it in the footsteps of those who are already pure devotees tad an tad anugami tad anuraga jananugami right tishtan vrajet prajet tad anuragi jananugami jana means these devotees these uh, these spiritual jannas anugami anugaman means to follow in the footsteps hmm? that's how we do it we follow in the footsteps of lord's beloved devotees who are deeply attached to his devotional service hmm. okay so that's the summary what is the summary don't waste any time chant and remember the lord's names and his qualities and pastimes engage your mind and tongue and this way you reside in golok vrindavan and we must do it in the footsteps of the devotees so you mentioned vraja what is that vraja tell us more mm. so then rup goswami tells us more he says what is this most sacred place vaikuntha janito vara madhupuri tatra piraso utsava vrindaranya mudara pani ramana tatrapi govardhana radha kundamiha pi gopulapate prema amrita plagana kuryadasya virajato giritate seva viveki nakha vaikuntha janito vara madhupuri tatrapi rasotsava vaikuntha means vaikuntha is refers to that spirit that aspect of spiritual world where narayan is worshiped in great awe and reverence and madhupuri refers to mathura mathura and vrindaranya means vrindavan and govardhana means that mountain in the vrindavan area govardhan and within govardhan this is mentioned radha kunda so let us read the translation the holy place known as mathura is spiritually superior to vaikuntha that's interesting it's spiritually su- superior to vaikuntha the transcendental world because the lord appeared there in mathura so that must be the most superior but even more superior to mathura puri is the transcendental forest of vrindavana because krishna's rasa leela pastimes took place there see rasot sabad okay that must be the highest superior to the forest of vrindavan is govardhan hill really yes because it was raised by the divine hand of shri krishna and was the site of his various loving pastimes is that must be the highest and above all even more than govardhan is the super excellent shri radha kund radha kund is a pond you can find in vrinda in that area it stands supreme for it is over flooded with the ambrosial nectarian prema of the lord of gokula gokulapate shri krishna so that radha kund which is found near govardhan is full of what is called liquid prema spiritual uh, highest spiritual blissful love of lord of, of of the lord of gokula lord shri krishna that is called radha kund so where then is that intelligent person who is unwilling to serve this divine radha kund which is situated at the foot of govardhan hill so this gives us a perspective Of what is the most sacred place? Remember, we were told 
that we should follow in the footsteps of Uttam Adhikari. We should make that person our guru. We were also told in the opening verse, what is the qualification of guru? Vacha Vegam, Manasaprodha Vegam. These are the urges that they can control. We were told the different kinds of Vaishnavas. Uttama Madhyama. We were also told to not be judgmental about a pure Vaishnava based on bodily appearances. So remember, keep all these things in mind because we are heading now in direction. And then now, prior to this, we were told to follow in the footsteps of the devotees, right? The essence of all advice is what? Always chant Krishna's name, remember his quality form and pastimes. And this way you live in Braja and you do so in the footsteps of the devotees. So again, be reminded, we can't do this without the help and the guidance and the footsteps of pure devotee. Now this verse is giving us the perspective of the spiritual world. He said, it said you stay in Vrindavan, right? It said Vraja, this Chan Vrajet. So stay in Vraja. So what, what part of Vraja are you talking about? So let's we give the whole uh, hierarchy of spiritually superior places. Starting with the Vaikuntha, and even more than that is Mathurapuri. And more than that is Vrindavan, and greater than that is Govardhan, and greater than Govardhan even is Radha Kund. Okay, so that's text number nine, which means there are only two more texts left. We'll go to text number 10. Who is the topmost devotee? Karmi bhya parito hare priyataya vyaktim yayur gyani na te bhyo gyana vimukta bhakti parama premai kaneshthastata te bhya stapa shupala panka jadrishas ta bhyo pisaradhika so this verse is entitled The Topmost Devotee and if you're listening carefully you will already get a clue who that topmost devotee is. It says Radhika. So now remember the previous verse it gives you the perspective of the topmost holy places. And then comes down to Radha Kund. Here now we we'll get a perspective of the qualities of different grades of people, and among those who are the devotees and who is topmost. So listen carefully. In the Shastra, it is said that of all types of fruitive workers, he who is advanced in knowledge of the higher values of life is favored by the Supreme Lord Hari. That means like, these are the jnanis. They know how to, uh, what life is about. They know what to do, what not to do. They're favored by the Lord. Out of many such people who are advanced in knowledge, the jnanis, one who is practically liberated by virtue of his knowledge may take to devotional service. Think about this. That means... The two levels higher than that, they're not even devotees. They only have taken up devotees, mm -hmm. devotional service. Those who take up devotional service and actually practice devotional service properly mm -hmm. are already situated higher than the level of the jnanis who are in knowledge of uh, all the scriptural regulations, scriptural knowledge. Their knowledge of the soul and the, the body, the spirit and matter, they know these things. But even those people, they may not always take up to devotional service. Only one who is liberated above um, there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita that mentions this Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Na Shochati Na Kamshati Samaha Sarvesh Bhute Shu Mad Bhaktin Labate Param that this is the kind of people who take my devotional service one who has reached the platform of Brahma Bhuta by knowledge they know they reach the platform of spiritual understanding Brahma Bhuta they are self-satisfied, prasanna, they're happy all the time. Na shochati, na kankshati. They are not lamenting for what they lost. They don't have a hankering for what they never had. They're free from that. 
and they equal to all living entities sama sarvesh bhuteshu that is the caliber of people mad bhaktim lavate param those are the kind of people who take up my devotional service so then we may ask ourselves hey i am also devotee right if we are not at that caliber we can only call ourselves aspiring devotees yes if we are having any sort of lamentation hankering for material selfish things if we do not see everybody equally as a child of god if we are not if you are allowing misery and and uh, moroseness to take over our heart because we didn't get something selfish that we wanted if you are not finding happiness in our spiritual practice then we can call ourselves devotees yes but more precisely we can we should call ourselves aspiring devotees so this is the level mad bhaktim lavate param so here we get in the perspective okay out of many such people who advance this gyan is right who advance in knowledge one who is practically liberated by virtue of his knowledge may take to devotional service he is superior to the others superior to the other gyanis for sure because he is taken to krishna consciousness now in krishna consciousness the highest stage is called love of god or prema so it says however one who has actually attained prema pure love of krishna is superior to him superior to who to the one who's just started out or who's took, taken up devotional service one who's attained prema is the high, is higher to that also that is called a very advanced devotee one who has attained prema genuine love of lord the gopis are exalted above all the advanced devotees also why because they are always totally dependent upon shri krishna the transcendental cowherd boy so gopis are above even those who attain prema they are the highest category among those devotees and among the gopis shrimati radharani is the most dear to krishna her lake her kunda is as profoundly dear to lord krishna as this most beloved of the gopis shrimati radharani herself so that lake is very dear to krishna radhakund who then will not reside at radhakund in a spiritual body surcharged with ecstatic devotional feelings aprakrita bhav mm. render loving service to the divine couple shri shri radha govinda who perform their ashtakalya leela the eight eternal eightfold daily pastimes is called ashtakalya that means the whole day is divided into eight sections and then they do different varieties of pastimes uh, during those different sect- sections of time it is called ashtakalya leela indeed those who execute devotional service on the banks of radhakund are the most fortunate people in the universe so if you have a copy of the book nectar of instruction the small copy if you look in the back the back cover is a picture of radhakund the front cover is a picture of the samadhi of rup goswami and the back cover is a photograph of radhakund so you can see that and now the final verse about radhakund krishna yochay pranaya vasati treyase bhyo pi radha kundam chasya muni bhi rabitas tadra ge vadhai yat preshthai rapyalam mashlabham kim punar bhakti bhajam tat preme dam sakrida pi sara snatur avik karoti what is radhakund of the many objects of favored delight and of all the lovable damsels of rajabhumi shrimati radharani is certainly the most treasured object of krishna's love and in every respect her divine kund is described by great sages as similarly dear to him undoubtedly radha kund is very rarely attained even by the great devotees therefore it is even more difficult for ordinary devotees to attain 
if one simply bathes once within those holy waters, one's pure love of Krishna is fully aroused. All right. So, Shrimati Radharani Ki Jai, Shri Radha Kundadham Ki Jai. So that is the summary of, is a quick study, an overview of Nectar of Instruction. Upadesh Amrit by Rupa Goswami, translated by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So if you have any comments or questions, we can uh, address those at this time. We have about another 20 minutes or so. Prabhuji, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I can ask a question till others are thinking. Uh, Prabhuji, um, so why is it difficult to go to Ra uh, Radha Kund, the sacred place? Why are devotees not able to go there? It's a good question. Physically, it's not difficult. Just like to go to Vrindavan, physically, it's not difficult. You can buy a ticket and get a, you know, get a ticket from New Delhi and take a train to Mathura and then from there take a rickshaw to Vrindavan and then from there you know you can uh, go to Yamuna River, you can go to this different, you can go to Govardhan, you can go to Radha Kund. But what makes it particularly difficult to see is that same thing, right? It said that so many yogis and munis, they, they strive so hard, but they cannot get darshan of the Lord. But millions of devotees are taking darshan in the temple. So easy. Why do they say it's so hard? See, darshan and there's a difference between seeing and recognizing. That's the key difference. Recognition happens when one's intelligence is aligned with knowledge. If the president of the United States came into my room right now, but I didn't have any knowledge, he didn't have any intelligence. And they're not aligned. I will see him. I will see the big fat guy with the orange face <laughs> and uh, blonde hair. But I'll not recognize. Hey, who's this fat guy in my room? Right? Because recognition is not there. So there's seeing and seeing means recognition is a very important part of it. So similarly, one may go to the banks of Radha Kund, but may not recognize. They think this is just another body of water, just like the next one and the next one. All over India, there's so many of these things. So what's the big deal about this? So unless one is blessed with the mercy of Radharani, one cannot even go physically. Even physically, people they try to go, but somehow some plants get canceled, or this happens, that happens. Even physically to get there, if, it, if people really knew, that place would be so crowded. Right? They don't know. That's one thing. And those who do know, uh, they do stay there or do spend a good amount of time there to study Krishna conscious philosophy. They chant Hare Krishna there a long time. There are quite a few devotees who do, do live on the banks of uh, Radha Kund. You know? So that is the, the two ways is that even physically you may not be able to go because one, things don't pan out. Mm. If Radha Rani's mercy is not there, you'll not go. Even if you have a ticket, you will not make it. Okay? And second, is that even if you make it physically, you may not recognize because the intelligence is not aligned with knowledge. Those are two aspects why it's so difficult. So there's a question from Rachel and Esther. On the stage of Kanishta, a person might use the quality of Kanishta to treat, to ill-treat other devotees. For example, a devotee may do wrong to another and when questioned, say, I am a Kanishta devotee, Upadesh Amrit says, I recognize Krishna, but not devotees. So how should we go about this? Yeah. So, if a person is, is being very mean to somebody else, if the person is, is not, is not uh, even treating somebody nicely, intentionally, and then he says, look, I am the Kanishta, I'm going to treat you badly. You know, that is very odd. First of all, I don't, I don't know if I've ever met anybody like that, <laughs> but you never know, there's all kinds of people. That person cannot even be called Kanishta. Because Kanishta means somebody who's actually trying to go to the next stage. Devotee means someone who is going for progress. Mm -hmm. If a person intentionally says, look, I am Kanishta, okay, I'm going to, this is where I am. You got to deal with me the way I am, okay? I am who I am. I'm going to remain this way only. That is not a devotee. Devotee 
immediately recognize, oh, I did a very Kanishta thing. I'm sorry. Not that I am who I am, you deal with it. No, that person is not even a proper devotee. That person, devotee means progressive. If a person recognizes that they have a lot of area to improve and they make a, a sincere attempt conscientiously to improve in those areas, that is called a devotee. Uh, otherwise, even the title Kanishta Adhikari is also pretty high. You know, it is doubtful that person even sees the deity as the Lord. Because Kanishta, remember, means they recognize the deity as the Lord. But person who behaves so badly, and even after having, not only that, but they're acknowledging they behave badly and they'll justify the bad behavior, it is doubtful that person recognizes the deity as the Lord also. Because how can you face the deity after treating someone so badly? He may not know because he's not fully trained. He may not have fully cultured about it. That is the reason why that happens. But now the question is, how should we go about this? So now that is, that is a whole different question. What should we do if someone is treating us very, very badly? So that is a very complicated question because there are a lot of variables. What is the position of that person who's treating you badly? What is my position relative to that person? What is their seniority, my seniority, juniority? That sort of thing comes into play. Best is to, if I am their senior, then it is my point to correct them. If I am their equal, then also I can, I can request them to talk to a senior about this, or we can approach a senior together. And if I'm a junior, then I can talk to some other senior devotee and explain the detail of that situation and ask them how to deal with this situation. You see? So those are three ways to do it. Uh, and again, it, comes, it always comes down to threes, right? Either I'm the senior, I am the same level in terms of seniority, or I'm the junior. So we have to process in three different ways. But ultimately, we have to make them some progress. And some people will not change. That we have to accept. The world is full of very discouraging people. And uh, so it is very important for us to learn that, okay, at least I should not be discouraging. <laughs> uh, you know, try to find our uh, areas of growth and growing. And if uh, they're being very uh, damaging to our spiritual health, then we should certainly either avoid them or best is to figure out a way by approaching other senior devotees to find some practical means of resolving conflicts. Conflict resolution is a whole subject in and of itself. But thank you for the question. It is a real question. It's a real problem that happens. You know, when two people get together, there will always be some conflict. It's just natural nature of the world. And we just have to learn how to deal with it uh, in a sattvic mode of goodness manner. Mm. Is that Rachel and Esther? I think they're saying something, but I can't hear. <laughs> Amongst themselves. <laughs> I see. I think. That, yeah. Uh, I think. So. Ask. Okay. Ask again. Okay, Rachel, Esther, is that okay? Well, they've disappeared. <laughs> That's all right. We have a question from, I think, Lakshmi Mataji. And Lakshmi. Sinu Kandalal as well. Sinu Kandalal and, was before uh, Lakshmi Mataji. <laughs> yes, Hare yes. Krishna. That is Lakshmi um, Mataji. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, my question is um, regarding, uh, like, Text five, you have um, explanation of Uttama uh, um, Adhikari, and then text ten talks about the topmost devotee. About is it saying that we should aspire to become like Radha? Like, how do we become? You know, I, I, you know, Radha, Radha Rani is like she's the ultimate. You know, in prema for Krishna, can we, as devotees? W will we ever be able to get to that? Position? That's a good question. Very good question. And uh, our goal is to follow in the footsteps of the residents of Vrindavan. See, actually, Radharani and Lord Krishna are not different. They are our worshipable. So in our, in the proper Vaishnava philosophy, actually Vedic Siddhanta, no one becomes somebody. Like I cannot become Mother Yashoda. I cannot become Sudama. Those posts are already taken. Our eternal situation is already also there. 
we don't know what that is in the spiritual world but we all have a unique relationship with krishna however the mechanism and the process and the procedure for re-establishing ourselves back into that eternal position is to follow in those footsteps of those who are already uh, residents of braja you see so that is the advice being given this tan braja tad anuragi jananugami anurag means uh, anurag means those who are uh, who are uh, spontaneously loving the lord and jana anugami we be want to become anugaman anugami means following their footsteps so the process is given and the highest grade of devotee is also given why the gopis are considered highest than higher than anybody else is because they are fully surrendered to the lord so we are also advised to follow in the footsteps of the gopis and aim for that caliber of being fully dependent on the lord but we'll never be at radharani's level because radharani is basically lord krishna in a female form you see so we must understand the difference that we strive to serve them not become them however we do want to come at their level of purity we want to become 100% spiritual just like radharani is 100% spiritual krishna is 100% spiritual the gopi is 100% spiritual not even one trace of selfish materialism that is the goal and we can only accomplish that by following their footsteps taking their advice and serving them so they are all considered like uttama adhikari yes 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 radharani is basically supreme personality godhead herself <laughs> see in our so that's we don't talk about her like becoming like that but we do talk about becoming to the level of the other gopis by serving them they are all uttam adhikaris without any anybody in the spiritual world is uttam adhikari even a frog in the spiritual world is uttam adhikari because there is not even one trace of material selfishness in the spiritual world see Prabhu ji, in that world, even the drop of water, the trees, the leaves, the flowers, everybody is spiritual. Everybody is alive. Every ounce, every little thing is alive. Flowers, uh, rocks, stones, the grains of sand, you know, everything is spiritual. Everything is. It's called chinmay, full of life. Here we have dead matter, but in spiritual world, there is no uh, inferior energy. Inferior energy is only found in the material world. Yeah. Thank you. It's a good question. We have questions from Sita and Lipa, and we have question from Priya going there. Can I just one minute? Can I interrupt before they leave? I would like to recognize Prakash Vaitha Pundrik Prabhu Madan Gopal. He's going to get angry with me, but the seed of Alred was sown by him. Yes, he's the temple president of Kisumu. He was on our program yesterday and today, so very honored. I, I actually, uh, what should I say? I told him, come and watch our Kenyan smart boy on the Zoom. So he came in, Ravi Nathwani, who is your fan. Every time I send your thing, he says, I'm there. Then there is Hetu Chaitanya today joined us first time. There's Rosa who has joined first time. So I would like to acknowledge if suppose they find it's too late and they disappear. So uh, thanks to all all the newcomers who joined in today with us. So thank you. Now you can continue. Thank you so much, all all the devotees who joined and those who are first timing, first time coming, Rosa and uh, Pundarik Prabhu and everyone else. And thank you for bringing your mercy. And uh, I mean, we even have someone called Mercy over here. So. That's pretty nice. Mercy's iPhone. So all wonderful devotees are here. So it's a big group. She's done a comeback. She had she was there earlier. She disappeared. Now she's done a comeback. I'm very happy to see her come back. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Mansi Ganga Mataji. It's always uh, good to know who all are on the audience. As you know, we have also been joined by some of our uh, U.S. compatriots. We have uh, Minash Prabhu and Lakshmi Mataji, and we have Hetu and Soham. Our Kinjal uh, Mataji is also here. Who else do we get? Um, yeah, and yeah, so we have uh, some good representation. We have Prem Chaitanya Prabhu also joining. 
So, Jai. All right, so we uh, come back to the questions. We have a few more minutes. All right, so Somia and Leap are asking, any person engaged in the service to Krishna will be considered as Vaishnavas, whether he is born in the family of Shudra or Vaishya. That is correct. Anybody who's serving the Lord is a Vaishnava. Vaishnava is beyond Shudra, Brahman, or any of these titles. Good point. Here, Govinda Prabhu says, we have three kinds of devotees, Kanishta, Madhyama, Uttama. Can we scrutinize to know what the level of each devotee is or we should focus on our own individual level? Please advise. So the nectar of instruction teaches us that we should recognize what those levels of devotees are. Why? Because we need to offer the proper response the proper interaction and the proper respect, proper level of respect to the different categories of these Vaishnavas. It is not that, oh, who am I to judge who is Kanishta, Madhya, Muttama? I'll treat everybody the same. That is not what Rupa Goswami is telling us to do. Right? He's telling us, what is the, hold on, let me just find that verse. You can see my screen, right? So he's telling us um, Vaishnavas over here that for someone who is a Kanishta, what are we supposed to do? Mentally honor them. Mentally honor means it's okay if we are not uh, serving them, worshiping them, opening our hearts to them. It's okay. Mentally honor them. Means in your mind respect them. Someone who is Madhyama, right? Or someone who is, uh, who is a little more advanced, who has given their life and really understands how to deal with other devotees nicely. To that person, we offer obeisances without reservation. And we want to become friends with them and learn from them also. And for someone who is very advanced, we must find ways to serve that person. Open up completely to that person. Be influenced as much as possible by that person. Hear from that person. So remember, we offer, we're doing three different kinds of activities to three different groups. If someone is a Kanishta and I keep serving that person, trying to open my heart, being influenced by them, I might be influenced wrongly. Therefore, it's important for us to understand whose influence we should take. We don't need to be Uttam Adhikari ourselves to recognize who is Uttam Adhikari. You see, we don't need to have a PhD in mathematics to recognize who is a good math teacher. Right? We can see, we can know from others that that's the one, you know, you'll learn a lot, go, you know. All other people will encourage us. He's recognized by the institution that this, you know, he's so many, you know, medals and he has taught generations of mathemat mathematic uh, scholars. So he has that, you know, He's the one we should learn math from. Similarly, it's important for us to know. This is essence of advice. We should not discuss, disregard this advice. Otherwise, we, will, we may not offer the right kind of respect to that person and we'll end up offering the wrong kind of respect to the wrong person. Remember, we have limited time and energy in this life. So where we invest our time and energy is important. Now, one thing is for sure, does not mean we disrespect any of these devotees. Right from the beginning, you should honor mentally even the lowest category of devotees. So disrespect is out of the question. Always be respectful. But if a newcomer, I choose not to touch his feet and bathe his feet in water and drink that water, and I choose not to you know, learn all the techniques of spiritual life from that person, it's okay. I'd rather do that to someone who's advanced. Doesn't mean I'm disrespecting the young person or the beginner person. It's not disrespect, we respect. But we have to know where to invest our energy and time. That's why we should know these things. Okay. So that was the last question. Are uh, there any other questions? We are pretty much out of time. Prabhuji, there is one more question from Priya Govinda Das. Prabhuji, please take that. Okay. Last question. That's the one that I just answered. Hare Krishna, not the last question. Ravi wants to 
also ask a question in due course. Yes. Uh, so Ravi, go ahead, because I think we just asked the, answered the last question. Okay. This is an unrelated question. It's more regarding Bhakti Charu Maharaj, who passed away. So thinking like a neophyte, meaning a person who is not so uh, into Hare Krishna, thinking as an outsider, I would ask myself that such a, uh, such a great devotee, why did Krishna choose to take him away this way? This way, meaning with such, such pain, such disease, such, and yet he served Krishna so well. I, can you get me? Yes, I understand. I understand your question, and that's a good question, and uh, that is a fairly common um, understanding that. Why does a devotee leave one leaves too early? He wasn't that old. He was a very dynamic preacher. He was making lots of devotees left and right all over the world, inspiring. And he left so early. Second, the way he left. It was such a painful thing to see him going through. I mean, just one week before that, he was there were photographs of him sitting in a chair just waiting in the waiting room of the hospital. And within one week, he's left us. So that must have been very painful for him. And uh, so these kind of questions are very natural. However, one thing we've seen a lot, lot of the times, very great personalities, they leave very early. You know, even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left at very young age. Um, Shankaracharya left at a very young age. Shankaracharya was one of the most influential acharyas. He left in his 20s. Who would have thought like that? So these decisions that the Lord makes, we have to take them recognizing that this is Lord's decision. It is something intimate between him and the pure devotee. His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami, a very dynamic guru. He also left at a very young age. I was there when he left. Bhakti Charu Swami was supposed to give lecture that same day in our, our New Jersey Zoom channel. In fact, we waited for him 20, 15 minutes because he said he was coming. That morning he said, I'm feeling a little feverish. He said, I'm feeling a little feverish, but no, in spite of fever, I'll come. That evening we waited for him. So he was basically going to talk to us just like a couple of hours before he was hospitalized. We didn't even know he was he has been taken. We had no idea. We were waiting, waiting, waiting. Then that whole hour, somehow we couldn't connect to him or any of his devotees. So we decided we'll just glorify him. So you can imagine we all got together. We had Jai Dwayta Swami Maharaj with us here in the class. And we spent that hour glorifying Maharaj, glorifying Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Not knowing that he was actually sick. We had no idea. But the point is that devotees who are such high caliber, Krishna has always special plan for them. You know, um, maybe Srila Prabhupada wants him on another mission, some other place in the universe, in some other universe. See, these devotees have given their lives to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada never forgets them. So this idea, sometimes we have in our mind that great devotees should all pass away in particular way. They should all be at least 95 years old. They should all be in Vrindavan or Govardhan or something like that. You know, and there should be at least 50 or 100 devotees around them chanting with Kirtan. And they should be offering garlands. At the moment he's leaving, there should be, you know, Yamuna water in his mouth, Ganga water in his mouth, and Tosi leaves, and he should be like that. So we have this preconceived notion of what it means when a devotee leaves the body. But the uh, intimate plans of the pure devotee, intimate plans of Srila Prabhupada, intimate plans of Lord Krishna, we do not know. And uh, therefore, to even get uh, too disturbed by the particular details 
of the manner in which the devotee lives, a manner in which, uh, you know, it's kind of like this verse over here. To be disturbed because it didn't fall within our preconceived notion of how a devotee should appear when they leave. It's kind of like this verse here, you see. Not exactly, but the idea is that we should not see the devotee's activities or pastimes from a materialistic point of view. It may seem imperfect the way he left. It may even seem that he suffered, but pure devotees do not suffer. So it's actually kind of offensive in one sense to think a devotee suffers. Devotee never suffers. Prabhupada, we know, went through two heart attacks and all that. And, and he went through so much pain. Pain may happen, but suffering doesn't happen in pure devotee's heart because they're connected to Krishna. So the manner and mechanism he leaves in one sense is not that significant. When Tamal Krishna Maharaj left, it was very painful because he left in a car crash. You know? But Srila Prabhupada promised him earlier on that when it's time for your, you to leave your body, I guarantee it. Prabhupada told him, I promise that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will take incarnation in your mind personally when it's time for you to leave your body. He told Tamal Krishna Maharaj. So imagine Prabhupada has given his word. So then how can we kind of apply our preconceived notions on how a devotee should leave the body? It doesn't matter so much. It is, it is definitely disturbing that he left so early in such unusual way. But we should understand these decisions and these uh, transcendental pastimes, they take place on a different platform, different level. And so we should uh, recognize that uh, and respect that and accept it. Acceptance is very really hard. We should accept it as the pastime of the Lord and be humbled by it. So those are only different, those are different ways we can take it. Ravi Prabhu, is that okay? Can Thank I you. add? Um, thank you. Can I add? Ravi, you should show yes. your face, okay? Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm not shaved, <laughs> that's I? why. I'm not. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> Mother yes. Gopal told me I'm setting an example of uh, no video, and I realize how everyone is on no video. I'm really sorry, Mother Gopal. However, Mother Gopal, I wanted to add in the sense with your yes. comments that when Srila Prabhupada was leaving his body, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he's, he made a statement don't get surprised at what is happening because this will happen to everyone. And even His Holiness Bhakti Chari Maharaj is, it just kind of cautions us, don't take things for granted. Anytime it can happen to anyone, wherever, yes? Besides all the points you said, to me it's always a cautionary one, like when I heard about uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, then you think, okay, get off with your bad habits and get onto the track because, you know, it can happen anytime. I, I personally, I feel, and Srila Prabhupada said that, that this will happen to everyone, yes? But you explained very nicely, it's, uh, we, we see the pain, but the devotees don't suffer. There's a difference between pain and suffering. Correct. Yeah. And that, that's the message to take home, Mataji, is what you made, what you gave, is that all that we see like this uh, is a message for us that we should be, uh, it should be a sobering message for us. It's never, no one can be too sober. You know, you can be too unserious, too joking, take things too lightly, but you cannot be accused of being too sober. We should always learn to sober ourselves and this will happen to us also. Prabhupada told this happened to me also. This will happen to me and the real sobering part is it could happen any time. If all the devotees left after age 95, then when I'm at 35, 45, I'm thinking, oh, I still have another 50 years. No, <laughs> we don't know how many years we have. That is a message to take home. We don't know. It could happen to us. It will happen to us. And we don't know what time it'll happen. When Parishit Maharaj was given the curse of seven days, he was actually happy. You know why he was happy? He was happy because now, Think about it from the positive angle. He has a ways and means to sit down and hear Bhagavatam. Can any of us here guarantee that we will live for another seven hours? We don't, we can't. We don't know if we're going to live another seven hours. Seven minutes also we cannot guarantee. If Parikshit Maharaj had guarantee of seven days, <laughs> the curse was such that seven days he'll die. Nobody can change the curse, which means tomorrow definitely he's not dying. Day after tomorrow definitely he's not dying. We can't say that for ourselves. 
He is much more fortunate than us. So similarly, we should not assume this will not happen to us and will not assume that we will have a warning. We may not. We may not have a warning. You know? Therefore, we take Krishna consciousness serious enough. Therefore, we do it 24 hours a day and we want to take it intensely enough so that when it comes time to leave our body, our consciousness is absorbed in Krishna. Okay. Thank you all very much for engaging me in this service. I appreciate it. Thank you all the devotees in the US also who came, uh, devotees in India, devotees of course in Eldoret and Kenya and East Africa and, and Uganda. Thank you. All the way from Thank you very Delhi, much. Delhi, Delhi, all the way. And, uh, let me introduce Maris Ganga of uh, uh, Madan Gopal's better half. He's also a very good preacher, very good baker, very good in everything. I, I had the good fortune of her association in the U.S. and also in Nairobi she with her son. So those who haven't, uh, who have come for the first time, that's Mansi Ganga. And behind Mansi Ganga is Mandakini, her mother. A very good, powerful family. I think we should let uh, Madam Gopal, you have another engagement, yes? Yes, we have to get going. We have to go to the temple. Yes, Pat Prabhuji, just glorify Pat Prabhuji. Yes, yes, Mataji, I am here. I, thank you very much, Prabhuji, His Grace, Madan Gopala Prabhuji. We are so grateful for your wonderful class. Also, briefly describe this nectar of instruction. It is a very tough uh, subject, but uh, you are just uh, closing within two classes. <laughs> uh, okay, no problem. It's a time and place and uh, all the things. Thank you very much, Prabhuji, for your precious time to giving us. Also, we thanks to, on behalf of his Colonel Lorette, also I th thanks you, we grateful to you. And also we thanks at the same time the devotees which join across the world. And we are so grateful. I'll also pray all the devotees, please, God will, Lord Krishna will bless you. Then you, we can, together we can progress in devotional service. Hare Krishna. I want to thank also Nitika so Mataji who has been hosting so graciously and so expertly all the time and putting it all together, keeping everything on track. I really appreciate it and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you, Kirti Kamal. Prabhuji, are you going to get your association next Sunday, Prabhuji? We'll have to figure that out. I'll let you know. There's a lot of things happening, okay. but we'll work out another date. I'll talk with you once again. Okay. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji. For a good vacation of His Grace, Madam Gopal Prabhu and all the devotees, please chant Hare Krishna Mantra once. Please join together. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting. Hare Krishna.